Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Austin McCormick here, and today we have the privilege to talk with Pastor Wilson March. Marsh, uh, the subject of our show is tobacco and theology. But before we talk about tobacco and theology, uh, Wilson, can you briefly uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your ministry, your YouTube channel, and perhaps your family if you want to, or anything else you want to tell us about yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. I'd love to talk about this topic, of course. Uh, so yes, I'm a pastor uh, in Dawson, Texas at First Baptist Church of Dawson. I've been here going on three years. Um, I was at another church previously as more of an associate pastor role. And then uh, before that, I was kind of in farming. So that's that's a bit of a, my, my background there. Um, I have a family, a wonderful wife. Uh, we've been married for going on 12 years. And uh, we currently have three kiddos, uh, two older boys and a two and a half year old girl. And then we have a uh, a great son on the way, Lord willing, in early February, John Haddon. So uh, so that's that is my family. We're looking forward to that. And uh, and then my YouTube channel, which I've been pipe smoking for, uh, I don't know, going on five ish years. And, you know, during that process of getting into pipe smoking, which Funny enough, it was my wife who got me into it. Um, so during that process, I, I got on YouTube, like many do, and to get help. And there's a community on YouTube, uh, the YouTube Pipe community. Uh, some call it the, the YTPC for short. And so during COVID, when that all happened last year, 2020, uh, some of the, the the content being put out just, just kind of dropped. You know, things got busy. Things were going haywire. And I was like, well, I'm kind of bored. I, I have a little bit of time to put something out. I, I want to do it for fun. And so last year, uh, around April-ish, I, I began making some contents on the Spurgeon Piper uh, channel. And it just took off from there. And so uh, here we are. Um, it's been a year and a half or so. And uh, it's it's been a wonderful kind of enjoyment on the side. So the name of your YouTube channel is the Spurgeon Piper. The Spurgeon Piper. Yes. Go figure uh, for a particular Baptist. Yeah. Uh, it made sense to, in, in my opinion. Well, great. And uh, once again, we're excited to have you on. We recognize that a show about tobacco uh, perhaps could be a controversial issue. So we wanted to do an episode on this, trying to bring a balanced perspective to this topic. So uh, I'll just ask you to begin this conversation. What is the theological and biblical explanation for a Christian to be able to smoke tobacco. Is it okay for a Christian to smoke tobacco? And uh, are there occasions where doing this would become sinful? And I'm going to follow up with this on a, with a question that I haven't sent you. So I <laughs> gotcha. Well, well, wonderful question, important question, uh, or both questions. Uh, in short, uh, can a Christian? Yes. Uh, is it sinful at times for a Christian to smoke tobacco? Absolutely. Um, and, and we can bring up tobacco or tobacco. We can bring up discussions on this when it comes to Christian liberty. Uh, we can bring up passages like, you know, Romans 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 8. Those are some of the major ones when it comes to Christian liberty. But uh, for time's sake, let me just focus on one passage. Uh, whenever I have a conversation with someone on this matter, and and I have quite a bit, um, you know, especially in SBC, Southern Baptist circles, uh, those who are in you know, modern evangelical circles, that this is a problem that persists. And um, I'm, I'm grateful in my church, it hasn't been an issue. But when it does come up, I, I usually use Mark 7, um, point to Mark 7 uh, for this topic. And and there we see Jesus respond to the uh, the tradition the traditions of the elders that the Pharisees were imposing on others, uh, specifically in that passage, the disciples. And they were requiring a, a ritual of, you know, washing themselves, uh, washing eating vessels, uh, even dining couches. And, and and so basically they determined their their spiritual cleanliness of man uh, or of items, not by the authority of Scripture, uh, but by man's tradition. And the the greater issue on the matter wasn't that they they themselves felt they needed to do that. You know, so I need to abstain from smoking tobacco in, in our situation and you do what you need to do. The issue was that they were imposing their, their beliefs as divine doctrine on others, you know, the equivalent of scripture. Well, after Jesus defends his disciples and he reveals the heart of the matter, which was the legalistic heart of the Pharisees, he then teaches what truly defiles a, a man. And so in, in Mark 7, verse 15, he says, 
Do you not see that whoever goes into whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not uh, his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. And we have that little parentheses. Thus, he declared all foods clean. And, and I want to get back to that in a minute. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles him for from within the heart of man. So this had to be quite a startling you know, statement to Jesus's hearers, especially uh, the, the religious leaders like the Pharisees who sought righteousness through obedience of the law. And, and this led to an idea that they were themselves were OK. It was like external things uh, that were bad or, or made them polluted or unholy. So then back to that parentheses that most translations pick up on in verse 19. You know, it says he or Jesus declared all foods clean. So Mark is writing this gospel account of Jesus to a Gentile audience in Rome, which that's what most believe. And, and we get to, he gets to this point and Mark makes certain to make clear what Jesus is declaring. And as it's the apostle Peter likely who's passing this on to uh, this gospel account to Mark to write down, it makes sense why that parentheses is there. So we, we think in Acts, it was Peter in Acts 10, you know, 20, 30 years before the gospel of Mark was written, that he had a vision from the Lord declaring that all foods were clean. And in the vision, he saw all kinds of animals that were once deemed unclean, according to Levitical law. And the Lord tells him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. What God has made clean, do not call common or do not call unclean. So as the, the Roman Christians are, are reading this gospel account, Peter and Mark want them to, to be certain that they understand the message of Jesus here, because this was a major issue, as we know, in the early church. Uh, we, we had the Judaizers, you know, those who believed that Gentiles had to follow Jewish customs uh, before coming a Christian. They, they held to the unclean, unclean food regulations, which the apostles had to combat and make certain wasn't being taught in churches. Now, Tobacco leaf likely wasn't in consideration, of course, at, at this time, uh, but the principle certainly applies. Um, I would not want to deem something the Lord created and called good in Genesis 1, um, as he declared all things he created good. I would not want to de deem something like this inherently bad or inherently sinful or impure. Now, could an individual st who struggles in indulging uh, with such things be in sin? Absolutely. Um, like with certain foods or, or with alcohol or making an idol out of entertainment, uh, TV or social media, you name it. Um, we, we, we have hearts prone to this issue. And in such cases, uh, the Christians should abstain as, as they be, would be falling into sin. But we should be greatly cautious of deeming something unclean that the Lord has called clean. Um, and I'll just say the uh, chapter 21, section two of the second London Baptist confession is really helpful on, on this matter, um, that God alone is the Lord of conscience and he has led it free from human doctrines and commandments that are in a way, any way contrary to his word and not contained in it. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, brother. And uh, you mentioned a passage that I wanted to follow up on. And so the next question that I have for you in relationship to your last answer is how should we consider the weaker brother in mm -hmm. a conversation about tobacco? So feel free to take as much time on this question as you like. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's a great one. Um, and it, let me, let me add this to actually another point I wanted to say, um, uh, for, for brothers and sisters listening who, who are struggling with this, or maybe they, they partake of, you know, a cigar or pipe, uh, approach this topic with grace, uh, especially when seeking to defend yourself or feeling that you have to defend yourself on the matter. And so, um, you know, I refer to the Second London Baptist, uh, Christian Liberty. It, 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 we also need to bear in mind, which it speaks of there, um, about the weaker brother. Uh, so if I know, and I have a lot in my area who struggle with addictions, uh, especially with drug abuse. Now, I don't, I'm not going to put pipe use or uh, cigar use, even kind of in a way, cigarette use and in, in the same level as, you know, heavier drug addictions. But uh, because of what it is, I, I will be cautious on who I'm smoking around. Um, I, I don't flaunt it, uh, not because I'm trying to hide it, but because it's just not, 
not personally what I do, just like I, I do lit workouts. Um, I do exercise. I don't exactly flaunt that I exercise. Well, same thing. Uh, I, it's something I keep to myself and I'll enjoy with others, but I am cautious on who I might be smoking around. Um, so we want to bear that in mind um, as we do uh, partake of it, which we should partake with joy, but bear in mind those who may be uh, struggling with it. However, uh, I don't think we have to avoid it for those who are just simply offended. Um, I think that's one way where we, the passages on the weaker brother can be taken wrongly. Um, if if you don't struggle with uh, tobacco use or, or anything like that, it's not like you have an addiction to it or what have you, you just don't like it. Um, I don't think that's a, you would fit under the weaker brother, so to speak. Um, that That's how I would approach the subject. But those who do have struggles, um, I, I do want to be cautious with them and, and likely avoid it when I'm in their presence. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. And with those two upfront questions, I think we've already uh, achieved the goal of trying to bring a balanced uh, perspective to this conversation. And so uh, continuing on from a theological perspective, especially uh, historical theology, church history, um, what historical examples can you think of where Christians of the faith did actually smoke tobacco? Are you aware of any? Yes, uh, I, I really like this question, um, and, and it made the the hobby, I guess you would call it, more enjoyable when I started digging. Uh, you know, first off, I I was drawn to pipe smoking by you know I, I had college professors, and then you know I have now seminary professors, or or know of other prominent seminary professors who who enjoy the pipe or the cigar. Uh, but there is a rich history of Christians enjoying the tobacco leaf for the glory of God. Um, we, we already talked about Charles Spurgeon, the obvious example, um, who enjoyed cigar smoking. And we know all those great quotes and pictures of him doing so. Um, less known, actually, is that uh, he also smoked a pipe on occasion. Uh, the uh, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, they actually have one of his pipes on display um, at their Spurgeon Library. Uh, then, then maybe we have the most two well, most well-known pie smokers. Uh, I think most folks are aware of uh, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, they really enjoy the hobby. I mean, you can't miss Tolkien's enjoyment of it when you're reading his, his Lord of the Rings trilogy or watching the movies. It's embedded in the lore. Um, I mean, he gives history on where the uh, the, the leaf that they smoked came from and. Uh, they had different varieties. It's really interesting to kind of read into that. Um, and and by the way, both C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, they, they were fans of a blend called Capstan, uh, Capstan Blue. You can still buy it to this day. Um, just a little side note. Uh, and then on C.S. Lewis, uh, one, one of his or one of my favorite references to pipe smoking comes from him. Um, in his foreword to On the, Incarna on, on the Incarnation by Athanasius, he writes... I believe that many who find that nothing happens when they sit down or kneel down to a book of devotion would find that the heart sings unbidden while they are working their way through a tough bit of theology with a pipe in their teeth and a pencil in their hand. Uh, that that quote always stuck with me, maybe give me more appreciation of, of the hobby itself. Uh, then we have other figures, cigar smokers, B.B. Warfield, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Carl Barth, they, they were notable names who enjoyed cigars. Um, we can go back further. Um, you have the Scottish divine uh, Ralph Erskine back in the 17th, 18th century, who, who was a pipe smoker himself. And he, in fact, wrote a poem um, on the matter, illustrating, I guess you would call the spiritual benefits of pipe smoking. Uh, and, and the poem's called Smoking Spiritualized, It's which your listeners can probably look up. Uh, so finally, let me let me in with another one that's more recent to my knowledge um, that our, uh, our our good friend, uh, mutual friend, Jake Stone, uh, he sent this to me and made me aware because he knew I was a pipe smoker. So Andrew Fuller, the, the particular Baptist missionary, he wrote a letter to John Ryland in April 1799, and he had this to say, I remember my vis visit to Bristol with pleasure and the treatment of my friends there with gratitude. I hope the students do not smoke more or longer than when I came. I must, however, say that I relished several pipes in their company. So that became one of my favorite uh, historical accounts of Christians enjoying the, the blessing of the tobacco leaf, uh, knowing that we have a, a, a great name like, uh, 
like like Andrew Fuller, who was also one who enjoyed it, um, in in with a Christian conscience. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to mention Fuller, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we've got a biblical explanation now, and we've talked about historical examples of Christians that have smoked tobacco. And now I'll just ask you, obviously, you seem to enjoy this. Can you testify of any examples of how smoking tobacco has been beneficial in your Christian walk? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I, I have to say it is one thing that uh, I enjoy. You know, thinking back to that C.S. Lewis qu- quote, um, it is one thing I greatly enjoy in the mornings. I, I wake up quite early to get my studies done, my time of devotion. Um, and, and it has been, it has been beneficial in that regard. Um, obviously it's not a, a needed thing, but I guess how we think of coffee in the morning, you know, it helps us wake up and uh, we enjoy it when we have our time of devotion. Uh, I, I enjoy it with, you know, having a pipe, uh, while reading scripture, uh, reading some theology and meditating over those things. Um, I, I do find great help there, um, in enjoyment, uh, time of reflection, you know, you'll notice one thing about pipe smokers. They're usually, uh, laid back, calm individuals and they're, they're usually thinkers. I I think there's a general type or stereotype there, but, um, I think there's a reason, um, I don't know what comes first, whether they're gravitated by pipe smoking or pipe smoking makes them thinkers, but it it does make you sit back, um, and, and, and kind of helps with contemplation, I must say. Uh, and then the other way it's been a great benefit is Christian fellowship. Uh, I have some fellow friends who are part of a Reformed Baptist church nearby, uh, uh, some pastors I've been able to get with who uh, we get together, some smoke cigars, uh, some smoke the pipe. And and that has just added to uh, the the great fellowship we can have with fellow brothers and sisters and, and enjoy it uh, for the glory of God. And so those those ways alone, uh, alone it has been uh, very beneficial. Hmm. Shifting the conversation a little bit, um, I think this is a topic that you have addressed on your show, and perhaps we could uh, link to some of the episodes that you have done. But what are the health warnings of smoking tobacco? Man, this is a great, important one. Uh, it's one I'm cautious of talking about. So, you know, let let me just first say that uh, I'm I'm obviously not a doctor, uh, uh, not a medical expert. I got to give that uh, heads up first. So, so check with your doctor, your your personal physician. Uh, but because of that, um, which is in pro- which was a it's it's a tough topic that has really interested me and I was concerned with. I have on my YouTube channel interviewed medical experts uh, uh, on this matter, which you know folks can find on my YouTube page under Pipe Health playlist. And and about I've also addressed some of the studies that have been done on pipe smoking, which are very few. Uh, there's been a lot of studies on cigarette smoking but not on pipe or really cigar smoking. And, and frankly, most of the studies and experts will agree, uh, well, at least the ones I say are fair, that cigarette smoking and cigar pipe smoking are apples and oranges. Uh, we're, we're dealing with two different animals. So that just bear that in mind. I, I think it's important to realize that. Uh, but to quickly sum up some of the well-known studies, there is obviously a, a risk to pipe smoking, um, and it's slightly greater with pipe or, or cigar smokers. And the most notable risk are mouth complications, you know, because you, your mouth is prone to being dry uh, and uh, the, the heat uh, release on from the smoke, it can cause irritation. Uh, but when practicing moderation and smoking coolly, which is important for pipe smokers uh, and in solid oral hygiene, you can really minimize those risks. Uh, I interviewed pipe smoker uh, or a pipe smoker who's a dentist. Uh, Jonathan Spurgeon, who's who's actually a descendant of Charles Spurgeon, by the way, which is really interesting to know. But he covers some great tips on good oral care for for pipe smokers, especially, but also cigar smokers. Um, you know, let me add one more other thing uh, to this. Uh, folks may not be aware, uh, cigar and pipe smokers usually the the majority don't inhale. So I don't think many realize that when they think about cigarette smoking and pipe cigar, you know, cigarette smokers, of course, they inhale into their lungs, uh, and which is one of the greatest, greatest risks of it, not to mention all the chemicals and uh, carcinogens in, in cigarette smoking. But pi- pipe and cigar smokers, they inhale just to the back of their mouth usually uh, to get that, you know, of course, the flavor, and then they exhale. 
and and so that that's just a big distinction that needs to be noted because it it does cut down the tr- a tremendous amount of risk that we think of when it comes to smoking. Hmm. Um, of course, we don't want to uh, do this to the offense of the weaker brother, but we also recognize that smoking cigarettes or uh, cigars, excuse me, or pipes can be done to the glory of God. So um, for someone that is interested in smoking a pipe or cigar, where would you suggest they start? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, I would just say find guidance, uh, so especially with pipe smoking, which that's that's what I'm more familiar with. I'll, I'll occasionally smoke a cigar, but mostly pipe smoking. Find guidance because there is a learning curve. Uh, many just we, we don't realize that and many jump in. They, they pick up a random pipe, some tobacco they find at a store. They fill their bowl. They light it. And, and then they find a host of issues. And, and then they push the hobby aside because, hey, this is hard or it's not working for me or I'm not tasting anything and all those sorts of issues. So, uh, you know, if you can, uh, this is almost a luxury, but find a local pipe or cigar lounge. And usually there are folks there who will be happy to guide you into, hey, what should I buy? What should I smoke? How do I smoke? Um, you know, all these different answers or, or, or questions, I should say, that they're going to come up. Uh, of course, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to mention my channel uh, because I have strove to to put out uh, information for those getting into pipe smoking because I had struggles and I found help and I want to do the same thing. So um, you, you definitely can refer to my channel. There's there's other YouTube channels out there that are a help as well that you can find uh, the Country Squire Radio. A podcast. It's co-produced by tobacconist John David Cole, who is a, a wonderful brother in Christ. Uh, he owns the Country Squire Tobacco Shop in Jackson, Mississippi. It's one of the greatest pipe shops in, in the United States. Uh, but the that radio podcast, definitely check that out. He puts out some great content uh, and, and, and has some, some wonderful insight there. Um, and I can't help but mention a book. Uh, there's the book called The Christian Gentleman's Smoking Guide. And this is put out by Pastor Zach Bartles and then Professor Ted Cluck, which maybe some of the listeners will know from the Happy Rant podcast. Uh, they they put out this book and it's just, it's a fun book. It does have information on, you know, help with cigars and pipe smoking. Uh, it has tidbits of people in the past who've smoked, you know, theologians, things like that. And so it's it's a fun book to have. It'll also be helpful as well. Hmm. Well, as we wrap up this conversation, do you have any final encouragements pertaining to your ministry, your YouTube channel, tobacco, theology, historical theology, any of the subjects that we've been addressing in this episode? Hmm. You know, I'll just end saying uh, when handled correctly, uh, when we we bear in mind the joy uh, of of the tobacco leaf, uh, its great rich history, both in the Christian and, and just world history. Uh, it can be a wonderful enjoyment, uh, and, and we should see it as something we can enjoy as uh, those who have been set free from sin, um, and we need to handle it well like that. Um, it's brought forth a lot of wonderful opportunities for me to share the gospel with those I don't know, or those who don't know it. You know, They don't know the gospel, and it's it's led to wonderful relationships with, with other brothers who and sisters who do know the Lord. So uh, it's created avenues to share the gospel. That's one of my favorite things about the hobby. Uh, so if you do jump into it, just be patient, you know, learn, uh, be more patient, uh, and it will pay off in the end. Hmm. Well, Wilson, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this subject. Absolutely, brother. Thank you for having me on. In this talk, we have covered tobacco and theology. We have given a theological and biblical explanation for why a Christian can smoke tobacco. We've talked about uh, occasions whereby smoking tobacco can be sinful, and we've talked about the weaker brother. We've also given examples of Christians that have smoked tobacco, including Charles Spurgeon, Andrew Fuller, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien. And then we talked about some practical ways uh, that one might use this to the glory of God. We hope this has been a balanced conversation, and we pray that this will be edifying to you. Grace and peace.